Hi, Geezer. Hi, Brenton. How you doing? How's the, uh, is the sound okay and the video? Sound good, all good. Great. Thanks, Geezer. I, I usually have to wait to get a response on that. Okay. GMT Master. Hey, how you doing? Oh, Britain, good. You know, I I just started realizing <laughs> one of the effects of all of this is none of us none of us are gonna have haircuts. <laughs> so we're all gonna look sort of shaggy. Uh the British hi Joas, how you doing? Uh the British uh, Prime Minister uh Boris Johnson. He, is, he has a perfect haircut for, for, for not getting a haircut. It sort of goes everywhere. You know, maybe that's uh, that'll be popular. Okay. Uh, hey, Carlos, how you doing? How are things in Panama? Um, I took an army cut this week. An army cut. <laughs> yeah. Who is... That's like they had a thing you put a bowl over your head, just shave everything around it. <laughs> oh boy. Um I'm thinking of shaving off my hair. Well, all of my hair went from the top of my head down here. So I now I've got a beard. <laughs> Before I couldn't grow a beard when I had hair, so I don't know. You know, this is this is sort of an interesting period, especially for some of the older guys, because a lot of younger people call this is life great. <laughs> for us, it's like, what? Where did this come from? I don't know. It's weird. Okay. Uh, one all over. Okay. Yeah, that'll work. Um Okay, guys. Uh, here's here's what I was thinking. Um, I think I I mentioned this to you guys, or maybe I didn't. Maybe it was in the afternoon group. But here's what happened. Uh, I uh, contacted uh, Vooten, Lannan, and Callan, and they're super nice people. And they said, "Well, as soon as you have a two D and a three D um, rendering of the watch case." Oh, this thing got open. Hold on a sec. Um, we'll uh, we'll be able to give you a quote. Yeah, man, I I don't know how to. I mean, with me, uh, this is as good as it gets. And you know, <laughs> I don't know. And somebody, you know, well, they got a oh, well, you can get a CAD and so forth. I now I know people who do that, but. I really, to tell you the truth, I, I wouldn't even be sure what to tell them other than here's the dimensions of the movement. Uh, and it's got a, you know, we, we need a, a case that the movement will fit. And so, you know, I don't know. Any other ideas along those lines? Hi, KK Chrome. How you doing? How are things in Hong Kong? Hey, Clyde. You have to put on the special glasses for Bill to be 3D. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Orange Chan, how you doing? Turkey Vulture. <laughs> anyway, um, hi, Abdul. How's everything in the Black Forest? Steve, good morning. Um, well, anyway, uh, hey, Stefan, how you doing? Uh, guten morning to you. Mor getting, guten Morgen. Uh, you get that uh, click fixed uh, or figured out, uh, Stefan? Hey, Jeffrey. Are are things uh, returning to uh, to what sort of post um, <laughs> post quarantine? Uh, yeah. uh, let's see.
what Fitbit uh, sleep score? You know, I should have. I I don't wear my. Uh, I, I don't wear this um, uh, for sleeping. I always charge it overnight. I don't know why. I, I probably could. Um, you know, but I am hooked up to a time grapher. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, listen. Uh, what would you think, or can we? Let's take a look at uh, is nearing normal. Schools open April 27th. That's good. Uh, do you generally prefer white light dials or black uh, dark dials? I, I like the lighter ones. Uh, oh, this is this is sort of the, the combination. Um, this is uh, F.P. Jorn um, Chronomat Surveying. It's got the... Um, it has a white dial and then it has a blued hand, but they're pretty dark. And uh, this guy, um, you see how it's doing? That's doing pretty good. It's really funny watch. Uh, I wind it up in the morning when I when I wear it and get it fully wound, set it, and it it does something strange. It, it it goes too fast or too slow. It just does something strange, or I'm not wide awake enough to realize that I've set it at the wrong time. One of the two things happens. But then I reset it, and it's perfect. I I don't know. I have no idea what it is. Um, yeah, Abdul, that's... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it's like in the Black Forest, but here Connecticut is—we got—we're—we're we're, we're like a big woodsy state. We're getting like Maine, inland Maine. I reckon uh, light dial on the bracelet goes with everything. Uh you know I like bracelets, but for well, it depends. You know, if for if we're bracelets add a lot of cost that's the only my only hesitation about a bracelet um and you know the the thing about a uh either a black dial with white or white with black it's a little easier to read but the the really good thing about it is that you can put in different straps i was thinking of getting like a a light sort of a powder blue strap with this it would totally change the character of the watch it would look wholly different what this is, this is F.P. Jorn's version of a beater strap. Uh, what they have on uh, one side of it is rubberized, and the other side is a gaiter. And so what you what you have here, rather than having one of those really nice gaiter straps, you have this rubberized one. They cost the same, which is <laughs> around four hundred bucks just for a, for a, a watch strap. Uh, but I figured, okay, well, as long as you get a good strap, um, I might as well have at least one with the uh, protective side. And I got one, both one each for the um, uh, Chronomet uh, Resonance and one for the Chronomet uh, uh, Souverain. So it, it's, it, it's, um, but you know, they only come in black. They used to come in black and blue, this, these uh, straps. This is actually, I'm not sure which one this is. I think this is a, this may actually be a very dark blue band. Um, it's hard to tell. Okay. Uh, I have my Explore 2 Polaron and Green Lizard leather strap. Looks great. White dowels are the most versatile. Yeah, that's sort of that, that's sort of what I'm thinking too. Um, okay. Okay. Hi, Glenn. How you doing? Um, okay. Wait a minute. Somebody said something with sarcasm. <laughs> how how can you tell? All right. Um, Ooh, wow. Okay. Uh, Carlos, uh, let's, let's tone it down a bit. Okay. We're, we'll try to focus on watches 
rather than the world's misbehavior. <laughs> okay. Um, a KK Chrome, dual color doesn't matter much to me. The most important thing is that there's good contrast between the dial and the hands for legibility. Uh, that is, that's true. That That's the same thing with me, too. Uh, I want a Batman with a uh, pangolin strap. Okie doke. Uh, I usually have on a uh, rubber B GMT mask. I think it'll get more bright uh, colors. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, well, let's talk about this. If let me uh, let me start off with a this one. I think this is like a 40 millimeter and it's got um, both sides of it uh, have the uh, sapphire uh, glass on it. And this was a, I don't know, it was $70, $80, something like that. I got it from um, Otto Fry. And his stuff is not inexpensive. But, you know, I think, okay, this is for a uh, $64.98. Well, it didn't fit. Sixty-four ninety-eight, or my um, ST equivalent of it. So, what I'm thinking is that what I mean, what about a good-looking case that happens to be a little bigger uh, than the uh, than the than the watch movement? And what about that? Thinking of trying to get a leather strap made for my strange reverso, a sporty one. Nothing in leather from JLC. Yeah, um, there are a lot of bespoke places around uh, Stefan for doing that. Okay, doc. So let's. Uh, so what do you guys think about that? First of all, uh, any suggestions on sources for sort of like well, we'll, we'll get. The size, and then if you if you Google a movement uh, like a popular one, a twenty eight eighty nine uh, ETA or something like that, or sixty four ninety seven ninety eight, which this was for, you you come up with you can come up with uh, two sources. One, well, actually more than two sources. One is Auto Fry in the U.S., but this stuff is pretty expensive. Um, and then they charge you an arm and a leg for shipping. But I, I don't know. Any any ideas on that? I were, okay, we're talking about straps. Uh, consider Aaron Bespoke with combat straps in Montreal. Okay. Yeah, that's a place. You know, there's a guy uh, in uh, Tennessee, too. Have any of you had, um, his name is um, Cheek, Daniel Cheek. Anybody have a, a strap done by him? He did one of mine once, and he did an okay job. Uh, I think he was, it was a little. He was he was in school and was trying to do it while he was still in school, and it took a little longer than it should have. But he uh, he's got the uh, apparently he's sort of now he's got people working for him and doing things a little more organized. I'll put it that way. Uh, but he's another source uh, for you. Aaron Tan out of Bangkok makes great straps at reasonable prices. Okay. Uh, KK Chrome. Can't speak highly enough of Aaron. All right, great. Okay, good. Well, we got some. Uh, this is a great source. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm always looking for another strap. Um, you know, the other thing, too, is that uh, uh, Clyde and... Um, KK Chrome, do you know whether uh, Aaron uh, has um, the uh, quick release straps or not? Oh, wow. He did it for the Kalpa. All right. Okay. I also like uh, Erica MN strap. All right. Oh, APB Paris. They are wonderful straps. I have uh, three of them uh, for my um, uh, hemispheres, my uh, uh, Parmigiani uh, 
Tonda hemispheres. I have three for different things. They, their straps are really good. They're very expensive, and I think most of them are bespoke, unless you get, um, you know, a lot of you guys have these pretty popular watches like Rolexes and Omegas and things like that, and I think they have some. They say, well, I want it for this and this uh, watch, and they'll have it for you. Also, they have uh, bespoke. Hey, Fahrenheit451 and John, how you doing? Um, printing non-original parts on your Jaguar is gaudy at best. Unoriginal parts on your Suzuki is okay. Mm, okay. Um, all right, I think what you're trying to say, Fahrenheit451, <laughs> that unless we get a... Um, bespoke case that were a Suzuki <laughs> instead of a Jaguar. Uh, you got a point. Uh, Perrin sells all kinds of watch parts. Perrin, Glenn, where is Perrin located? But mainly for ETA. You know, yeah, most of the stuff, you know, for making watches are for ETAs or ETA clones. Um, Camille Fournette gator straps are awesome. Okay, Camille Fournet, a uh, U.S. and Canada. Okay, great. Uh, you know, we all worry about Canada. <laughs> uh, okay, Camille. Wait, 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 gator straps. Perrin. Okay, I'll, I'll check that out. That's, that's good to know. Um, okay, well, now, uh, I have another, <laughs> yet more, there's more to come. Let me, this is a, this is something I got. Hi, Williams. Um, I got a, have, have any of you seen Laurent Ferrier Square? I, there's a series of watches he calls the Galette, or, or Galet Square, Okay. Well, I like it a lot, and I found this. I don't know where I got it. I got all kinds of stuff, and I have no idea where I got it or where it came from or what I was using it for. And I got this. This is a pretty big sucker. Uh, but, you know, it. I think, well, you know, there's another idea. It's sort of a, having squared out like that uh, as an idea. And, again, this is off the shelf, but it's pretty thick. Okay, uh, like I can recommend Perrin uh, here in Toronto for sourcing of watch-related parts and tools. Okay, you know, uh, it, it for I I I don't know how difficult it is in Canada to get stuff, but boy, you ship something across the border and from Europe from from China somehow. It's it's very easy. <laughs> I don't know why. I bought uh, parts from China, and they'll you know they show up on my doorstep about you know three weeks later. It takes a while, but they're, they're I never had a hassle. Uh, you know, get a thing. Oh, there's a notice that the people down at customs uh, they have a hold up for it for some reason, and it's usually some little detail and paperwork. Uh, but somehow the Chinese uh, operations. They've got somebody there who knows how to do everything right, and so there's no holdup. Uh, again, I'm. It's not that the other ones don't make really good products. It's just God, going through going through everything. <laughs> you're mo. You're, you're no most pin. Okay, uh, didn't brands use regularly outsourced parts uh, before the emphasis on in-house? Well, you know, this is something, that the, uh, uh, Clyde, the, the outsourcing was of things like um, cases and, and so forth, and uh, sort of sort of the pre-high horology uh, where people were expected to make their own movements was very common. Uh, I mean, it was a thing. This is what Biver talks about. He said, well, you know, back in the good old days, 
uh, we did all of these things and, you know, we had certain movement makers and they'd make movements for everyone. We didn't worry about whether it was in-house or not. And the only problem with that uh, sort of a almost flippant assessment is that watches weren't insanely high priced. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> you know, what the, so using parts from other places, I think is, yeah, they do that all the time. The, the big thing comes down now in sort of the age of high horology is the movement, okay? Is the movement in-house or not? And the, to me, it's, it, it's if you have a high quality movement like Vosher, it doesn't matter where it comes from. What is important though, is that if you get an inexpensive movement like mass produced ETAs or Salidas, and then charge the same that you would do for a, brand manufactured uh, movement that's where you that's where things get hanky and this is something that Bibber didn't even never seems to uh, to to bring up uh, he just sort of lauds the good old days before quartz and everything else uh, those things are gone with the wind all right what's going on guys uh, let's see uh, I know another wholesaler in Germany I can't remember their name. Yeah, hey Glenn, uh, I got some wonderful um, dials, and don't know if I ever got a cape, but I got a really nice enamel dial from Germany. But now that I found a guy who's just, who's just down the road from me, I'm gonna go check him out and uh, see what he can do for us later on. Good morning, uh, Mike. How are you? Um, there are so many cool watches that use JLC calibers for ages. Makes me buy them. You, you know, yeah, this is this is true. Uh, JLC has supplied uh, uh, movements for Patek Philippe, for Veyron Constantin, for Audemars Piguet, all of these other ones that are, and and it, you know, it, I suppose it makes sense uh, when you're charging, you know. Five, ten, twenty thousand dollars for a watch, and going north, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, what you're paying for is like a, you know, ten thousand dollar dial and a, you know, ten thousand dollar case and a twenty dollar movement. I don't know. I think Bibber said the current emphasis on in-house was done primarily for marketing purpose. It would end up uh, biting the, uh, yeah, biting the industry in the arts. Well, yeah, he, I, I think he's right in that respect, but he never talks about why the prices have to be so high. Uh, all of the, you know, love and care that you put into a watch, the most, the most skillful part is in the movement. Uh, making a case, making a dial, making the hands, the straps, and so forth, good quality tells. But it's nowhere near as complex as as making a movement. And, and when, when, when you look at Philippe Dufour's uh, simplicity, my God, you can, you can, it just like almost talks to you in terms of the quality of it. Anyway, well, that, I don't want to go on about that. Um, Okie doke. In the good old days when all those super expensive pocket watches had Ulysse Nardine movements, yeah. More like the name on the dial. Uh, Clyde, that's it. Yeah, well, there's, there's too much of that. Um, I was, by the way, too, I was looking at um, – uh, Fusi and chain uh, watches, uh, seeing what they're like. The uh, somebody had said yesterday, I think that uh, Zenith has a Fusi and chain, and they do. You see how thick those things are. Uh, I mean, it would be wonderful to have one. And I'm gonna, I gotta uh, talk to this guy up in Massachusetts about some that he had. Um, Oh, yeah, Here, here's another kind of thing that's sort of funny. And it's sort of the, the whole issue of exclusivity. 
Now, at one time, you know, the royalty and nobles and everything had some really nice stuff. I mean, they'd have an in-house uh, watchmaker like the King of France did with uh, uh, Louis Breguet or Abraham Louis Breguet. And so the, the whole idea of exclusivity, you would go to the House of Dior or Hermes or one of the luxury brands. Now, the luxury brands were actually made on the basis of the designer, just like a great watch is based on the person who makes makes the movement, all right? Um, and so if you have something uh, by F.P. Giorno, if you have something by um, Parmigiani, you know you got the watchmaker right there. On the other hand, with my favorite whipping boy, <laughs> brightly you never know what's in there i mean it's like you got a mystery meat movement maybe it's something that they did make and they did a good job of it or maybe it's something else some some cheap movement that they gave another name to and they're selling it for way up here i don't know um yeah uh price will be high as long as people will pay okay yeah now going back to this exclusivity here is the irony, okay? And this is what happened with Dior. It happened with all of these uh, Furman, Furman Jean, I don't know, I can't, Furman, what's his name? Anyway, all of these famous Italian and French designers. Uh, and also, too, this was also true with men's clothes. You have, um, like Brooks Brothers, used to be very exclusive, but not anymore. <laughs> you, get, you can get them online and, you know, they have sales and everything else. But the, the, the problem with exclusivity is that you can have an exclusive brand and uh, go broke. I mean, you, you have, you take something like um, uh, Van Cleef and Arpels. You, those guys, I don't know, they must have some money from somewhere. And, and so if you have like a $100,000 uh, watch, and I think they probably do. Well, how many people are, are going to afford that uh, or can't afford? It? Not too many. So it's very exclusive in that respect. But on the other hand, some of these other brands that used to be very expensive and very exclusive, now they're, they're not anymore because they realize that if they sell more of them, they can make a lot more money than just to a few. But they'll call them exclusive. And so here we have a contradiction of that the more available they are, the less exclusive they are. Uh, one of the, and to me it's a flat out scam, are these limited editions. The only, uh, the limited editions, you know, they'll put something on it and say it's a limited edition. Well, mm, okay. On the other hand, you have Harboring 2 where, you know, Richard and Marie are <laughs> working their little Austrian workshop and they're knocking out maybe 100, 200 a year not because of exclusivity, but that's for the level of work that they want on their watches. That's what they do, uh, except they don't charge a lot of money for it because they have <laughs> so, sort of Richard had an ideal of not exclusivity for everyone, but good quality watches for everyone. And so that was sort of a, a one of the great ironies we have. Uh, you know, somebody puts a little gizmo on a watch and say, you know, limited edition. I got some limited editions that way, but it wasn't because I got them as limited because nobody else wanted them. <laughs> I got it for a good price. Hey, Jeffrey, how highly regarded are uh, Frederick Piguet-based movements today? My Breguet Classic runs on one, and I'm not sure whether I should uh, swell with pride or hide, the hide in the corner. Um <clears throat> Frederick Piguet is, I, you know, I think they're well regarded. I mean, here's one one way to look at it: whether they're well regarded, whoever used them. Well, if you if you look at the history of your, you know, your holy trinity, I think all of them had used some as one or another at one time or another. Uh, the same thing with uh, Gerard Perregaux uh, and Jacques Lecoutre. They, their movements were used by some of the top watches. So you, you have, if you have one that has a, um, 
uh, Frederick Piguet in it. I, I certainly wouldn't hide it. I, I've got a Frederick Piguet uh, f supposedly fancied up somehow by Vesper and Constantin and my uh, 1972 that I had on yesterday. And that thing is, <laughs> it keeps perfect time. I just don't, you know, it's small. It's one of the smallest um, movements that I think uh, Vassar and Constantin ever had any of their watches. They said they made a smaller one at, at another time. They probably did. Hey, Salmon, how you doing? Where'd Salmon come from? <laughs> uh, okay. What did Abdul say? Well, I got to see this. Any limited edition more than 100 pieces is not a limited edition. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've seen some limited edition. It's a limited edition of, of only 2,000. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, the numbers, Abdul, change as the population grows. Um, you know, the population is just, you know, it grows and grows and grows. And so you have a smaller actual number make something exclusive. If, if you have a population of a million, um, how exclusive is something? Well, if you, you know, two or three of them. If you have, you know, half a billion, uh, you know, then a several thousand are pretty exclusive. It's, it's a funny kind of math. Hi, hey, Rohit. How you doing? Exclusivity should be a byproduct of good quality watches, making it not the sole objective for any watch manufacturer. Rohit, that's exactly what I think, too. I And it doesn't matter whether it's exclusive or not. It, but if, if it is a result, because they're taking their time doing it, and, and I think that's why I like uh, a lot of the watches, is because of, they don't make a lot of them because you can't bang them out by the millions. Sri Lanka. Who's from Sri Lanka? Oh, Salman, you're from Sri Lanka. Man, I tell you, I, I was in Sri Lanka a long time ago, and that place is unique. I love Sri Lanka. Mm -mm -mm. Went to I went to Ratnapur, I think it was called Ratnapura, where they had the uh, uh, they had all of the uh, uh, sapphire mining there. These are <laughs> there's, there's something other than man-made sapphire. Okay, let's see. Are the watches ready for delivery yet? Uh, yeah, they are, uh, Watch Habit. They're about as ready as uh, our testing kits are <laughs> for, for, for coronavirus. Uh, no, I mean, you know, we, we've got, this is something that apparently I didn't realize that uh, you had to have a, you know, how much stuff you had to have for a case. Usually I just like buy an off the shelf case. And that's what I was wondering about. Um, your two favorite watchmakers, IWC and Briley, send you an invite to visit their factory with your wife. All paid. Which company would you choose? Uh, probably IWC. I think they have a little better history. But um Somebody, you know, a lot of people have gone to, on these uh, on these tours, and they uh, who's the guy that um, a couple of different ones I know they they have that group that goes to all of the different uh, Swiss, and they have another one to go to Germany. Um, I think it's Watch Time puts it on one of them, and uh, you, and they have these guys in there, and they put on their white coats and. Ta -da, ta -da. <laughs> it's looking like a, hey, that's what we ought to do is get a white, get these white smocks. I know a place you could order a million of them for pretty cheap. And uh, I don't know, put a logo, get a logo for us <laughs> to have a run around on those things. Oh, I'll get a, a for pretentious watchmakers. I'll get a pretentious watchmaker smock. Well, that would be great. Maybe I'll do that. I, I know a place that was, uh, that <laughs> will, will embroider them. Boy, that would be a fun thing to have. Let me think about that. Hey, Rodrigo, how you doing? <laughs> uh, Roth, Rothnapura. Thank you. Uh,
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> that Silica was called Salon. Yeah. I don't know. I know that was that was a you know that was a long time ago. That was when I visited uh, Clyde when he lived there. He's right. He had a different name then. <laughs> Between Blanc Pawn and JLC, which would you prefer? Boy, that's a good question, Riza. Uh, I like them both. I like watches by certain ones of them. Blanc Pawn essentially is a a watch company that is insides are made not of ETA, but of Frederick Breguet. I'm pretty sure. And JLC, I like too. Uh, on my list right now is the uh, watches I'd like to have are the uh, True Second, which is a JLC. But man, there's so many other ones. They're just, who knows? Don't tell me there's no East India Company anymore. <laughs> Clyde. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Clyde used to smuggle stuff for the East India Company. <laughs> he he and Terry and the Pirates. Uh will order the Longines Moon Phase new for 1950. Not fully saying or do I have to return as soon as possible. I don't know. You know, the long jeans, I've seen a lot of interesting long jeans. Um now long jeans, I think. You know, they're dependent on ETA, and the relationship with ETA is, I think, changing. Uh, I know that Tissot, it wasn't with ETA, but somehow through Swatch, maybe it was involved ETA in development of the Powermatic 80. Now, I know other, other, uh, other brands other than Tissot have it, but I think that they were actually involved somehow in developing it. I'm not sure how, but this is what I understand. And I think that may be why they knocked down the, um, knocking down something like this, I think is a good thing. They knocked it down from four hertz to three hertz. Okay. Took the meal beater out. <laughs> okay. It's kind of a, oof, a one trick pony, isn't it? Might as well uh, call it discount AP. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, Blanc Pond has, they, they got some interesting uh, models, the, the Vila Ray, and then they have the um, uh, 50 Fathoms. Now, the 50 Fathoms, that was one of the watches I talked about the other day, the video we had, uh, that has the uh, Frederick Piguet 11, what, 18 or 8, 81, something like that. Um, and so to me, that's, you know, that's sort of pretty interesting. Um, there's certain, um, what's his name? I can't think of his name. He, he's got one, and he's always talking about how great it is. Um, Don, Don Hayes has one. He loves the thing. And, he, and uh, I think the, it was up for sale recently. <laughs> I don't know why. I would say Longines is a good watch if you want to keep it. Yeah, a lot of these things, she'll ask, if you buy a watch and all you're thinking about, well, how much money can I get for it? I, I, I think two things will happen. One, you'll get ripped off. And second of all, I don't think you get that good of a watch if you buy, if it's based on that. Let's say you get a, and again, this is not a slam on Rolex. Uh, if you want your money back, get a Rolex or get a Patek Philippe. But, you know, a lot of times I think people get a bad Rolex, not because it's a Rolex, but because something happened to it or was mistreated before they bought it. And yet, because it has a high resale value, people buy them anyway. Uh, 1150. Okay. Uh, I don't know. No, uh, Rohit, I don't agree. I don't think, I, I think the Vila Ray is something you ought to take a look at. I think that's a, that is a very nice watch. It's sort of their Calatrava, in my opinion. Hamilton uses Powermatic, Katie. Yeah, a lot of, see, a lot of the ones owned by uh, Swatch do. Yeah, no, they got a lot of stuff at uh, Blanc Pond. Most long jeans have a modified ETA. Yeah, John, that's exactly what they are. They're owned by Swatch. Um, and they don't have, they didn't come with, uh, like Blanc Pond, they didn't come with Frederick Piguet.
<laughs> okay. Rolex are my two favorite brands, hype and all. Okay, you watch have it. If I were selling watches, those would be the two I'd want to sell. If I was collecting them, I <laughs> that's something else. Okay, newish Blanc Pond Pilot Retro Chronograph is cool. All right. I am saving money for a Zenith Defy. Oh man. That you're getting a you're getting a mule beater there. What <laughs> one of the what five hertz ones, uh, uh Glenn or one of those really fast ones. Not even a fan of the FF, but love the uh mill spec. Hmm. Uh, okay, let's see. Sub is more robust and more stigma. Yeah, that's true, uh, Abdul. You're absolutely right about that. Um, if you could have to choose one watch from Roger Smith and Philip DeFleur, which would it be and why? It would be the um, simplicity from uh, DeFleur. The reason for that is is that it it to me it's almost a perfect watch. It's got everything. Everything that's done about it is as good as it can possibly be done. Runs at two and a half hertz. Of course, <laughs> just about everything. Everything I think that uh, Roger Smith has also runs at two and a half hertz. Plus, you get the um, the modified uh, uh, George Daniels escapement. I mean, the, the, that kind of choice is very hard. But I, I'd still go with the uh, simplicity. Um, the only non-ETA are their very high-end Long G's uh, Lindbergh. Hmm, okay. Uh, which watch to use a natural stone inside the movement? Oh, yes. Um, I've got one. There's the uh, Lang and Heim put a great big diamond, a real diamond, a mine diamond, on top of the... Uh, a uh, balance shaft. Anyone with a Blanc Pawn or Breguet in their sights, keep a lookout on Hong Kong dealers. They're dealing now. Okay, good to know, Jeffrey. Um, the Breguet, I really like their tradition. I think that's neat. Okay, well, listen, um, I guess we didn't <laughs> come to a conclusion about off-the-shelf uh, cases and stuff. But uh, I got to run. And hello, Angelo. <laughs> glad glad you could make it. Got to go now. Uh, I'll be back this afternoon if you guys are either up like at 3 o'clock in the morning in, <laughs> in the Far East or, or depends on where you are. Anyway, take care. Everybody be safe. And uh, hey, pseudoscientists.